Hey guys, from Smoky Pilotus, and this is part five of my Christmas caroling series. And I'm gonna hold this up and whoop some more. Okay, here we go. And let's continue where we left off. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together. Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the special purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold and he began to wonder which of his curtains his new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again established a sharp, sharp that is, look out all around the bed. For he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity. Wait a minute, I'm looking at something, thank you. Okay. Sorry, lost my place. And I am still looking for it, so I'm going to have to read some more. Oh, I, I read that part, okay. Okay, lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of his subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as heartily as this, I don't mind calling upon you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances and that nothing between a baby and rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared from us anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, and nothing came. All this time, he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant, or would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, what is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it and would unquestionably have done it too at last, I say. He began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the, might be in the adjoining room from whence on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about it, but it had, had it, under, it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their glorious, uh, disteem, with their, del sorry, delicious steam, that is, an easy state upon, uh, made the, oops, I'm sorry, this couch, there sat, a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape, not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. 
Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, ma'am. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. The garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet observable beneath the ample folds of the garment were also bared. On its head were no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded around its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. Have never walked forth of the younger members of my family meaning, for I am very young, my older brothers born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night, on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pig, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music. And scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings, and from the tops of their houses whence it was mad delight, to the boys to see it come plumping down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting it with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plowed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts. And here's a lovely illustration before I move on to the next page. Heavy wheels of carts and wagons. Furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels. Hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. I lost my place and I will find it momentarily. The channels Already with the part. The sky was gloomy, and the shorter, shorter streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of city atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There, were, there was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet was there an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clear summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain for the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee i'm trying to get comfortable as i swivel around my chair <coughs> sorry coughing and i pardon poor least pardon my coughing okay right that part. okay da, da, da. exchanging a facetious snowball Better natured missile far than many a wordy jest. Laughing heartily if it went right and not yes heartily if it went wrong. The poultry shops were still half open and the fruiterers, fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot bellied baskets of chestnuts shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. 
And I must say, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to stop there for now. I will be returning with the next part of my Christmas Carol reading series. And of course, the visual marker with the number, I'm going to put at the beginning of mo the first two videos, I didn't um, have my visual marker, but the later videos, I did have my, you know, use my, I found and use my visual marker with the number. So I'm going to use that the rest of the time to be easier for me and everyone else. So I'm going to read, I'm going to continue soon to be continued. And until then, I'm green sonically yours. Because poetry, and in this case, during the Yuletide season, poetry and prose bloom eternally.